Hello, and this is Dustin Husky, and let's talk about something I've been thinking about a lot. We're really 1970s and 1980s cars total shitboxes. Interiors that fell apart, uh, bodies and chassis rusted and, you know, broken. And the mechanical bits, the engine, transmission, maybe axles and whatnot, were all faulty and kept breaking down. And a lot of people who talk about cars from these time periods describe them as total shit boxes. Some of those cases, they're right. And others, maybe we beat this era of automotive history in the United States a bit too harsh. And maybe I can explain, maybe be devil's advocate for this time period, because I do remember 70s, 80s cars growing up. And I would like to at least give my take about, you know, the situation. So this is going to be a three-part series. We're going to talk about the mechanical, interior, and exterior parts of cars from this time period, which in many people's minds to be total garbage. And my extensive experience about uh, just cars in general, I've surrounded myself with so much just experiences overall on either fixing, driving, or just being around old cars from the 1930s until the present day, of course, because you know what, we're all driving pretty modern cars in the last 20, 25 years. Although 25 years, it's classic car, 20 years in the state of Wisconsin. But we tend to view older cars as rolling junk. I don't really think so. So let's let's get into mechanicals. So I've worked on a lot of cars from the 1920s till really the 1960s, I would say at the most. 70s cars are much like 60s cars and 80s cars are much like 70s cars and a bit of 60s. Some very, very few engines from the 1960s are still being produced in the 1980s. There's a few, but a lot of these engines are new from the two gas crunches of 73, 74, and 79. So there are, new there are new generations of engines during this time period that people are starting to get to used to. Um, there are a lot of great mechanical overlap, if you may, between these time periods. The classic uh, 305 and 350 engines, which were made well into, what, the 90s? From uh, 1950s, they all started off as the 283 V8 block, a small block at its time. The longest produced engine family in, I think, automotive history, just same block just kept evolving which is fantastic it went from carburation to fuel injection at the very end and i don't even know if they might still make them i don't know i don't know i have to take a look at that don't i don't do too much research before these videos because i'm just going off on what i already know in the good old noggin and just experiences so 1970 still we're just finished 1960s, so a lot of these engines are 1950s, 1960s in origin. And you know what? I can't say much about them because they ran. Um, to think about it, mechanically, a lot of cars during the 1970s and the 1980s, mechanically conventional. There's nothing radical about them. They all ran as they should. I would say they ran a bit more rougher because uh, tolerances may not be that good as it is today where 
even my 67 Skylark 300 cubic inch engine. It's a very smooth engine. I tuned that thing out as best I could, and it still runs a bit rough. Even my dad threw several thousand dollars in the 1980s to smoothen out that engine with a whole rebuild. Runs a lot more smoother with brand new 80s period bearings. Better than 60s period bearings, because they don't last very long. You own a classic car, you want to make it last, replace everything that is a ball bearing and shims and bushings. Because you know what? You'll make your life a lot easier. Um, you can keep everything, everything else about transmission, engine, axle, whatnot. You keep everything as is. You replace just those three. You're going to have a much better time. And the engine will run so much smoother. And just freeze up a bit of the revs, maybe freeze up a little bit of horsepower. Not a whole lot much, because it's just ball bearings. It's just better made. So, as I said, that really as far as engines, transmissions, and axles are concerned, they're all pretty bulletproof, whether if you're looking at domestic or import. I really can't see so much an issue as far as mechanical reliability. Although all cars during this era may still have issues. And that's much like today. It's always possible that a certain set of engines, a certain group of axles, and a certain subfamily of transmissions may have issues down the line or straight from the factory and may need reconditioning or replacement. They did that back in the day. It's just pretty normal. Um, I would say 70s, and although you have more vacuum lines, if there's anything about an old car, is you see vacuum lines become a thing in, what, 74, 75, when um, Clean Air Act, is that Clean Air Act? I forget which. Uh, really took hold, and that's when smog testing became really, really huge in this country in particular. That's why a lot of import cars started to starve itself on horsepower because they had to be uh, downgraded as far as overall output is concerned. You have to make sure you can pass American emissions during the 1970s and 1980s, so a lot of these engines that uh, had much better fuel economy and higher horsepower ratings in Europe or in Japan, they were an old sock in America. Even the good old classic 350 Chevy V8, by the mid-70s, they were down 170, maybe 200 horses. And by the late 70s, they were just hovering over 100. It's just kind of how it is. So, I'm saying that reliability for a lot of these cars is key. And yeah, anything can break down. Although imports, they did it better. They were built better. They were engineered better. And they were built to a higher quality. So they had a less likely chance of breaking down. But even a good domestic produced car won't break down as often either. It just depends on that individual car and how it was built. How much care it was put into assembly. Or specific parts may be already defective from uh, subcontractors. Because all these factories, they either produce their own parts or they get them subcontracted to another company. And sometimes subcontracting is not always that great. Subcontracting is a cheap way of getting components for anything. And if you learn anything, if you subcontract, you know you're trying to get something cheap. And it will piss you off in the end if something doesn't work out because subcontracting. You make something within a factory, you know it's going to be made to spec and to its quality because you're all working within the same factory, you've got to make sure everything works just fine. So why do we think of, and again the 70s and of course the 80s, we're still fighting smog, we're still fighting um, emissions equipment, we're trying to find new ways to get power back up, and it really wasn't until 
the 1990s did power start to rise once again in cars. So mechanically, what am I looking at in the 1970s and 1980s that's, in a descriptive term, a shitbox, total junk? And I gotta say performance. Not so much maybe reliability. Yeah, you can find old 60s parts, put them on, uh, put them onto a then current car in the 70s and boost up power, but at the cost of uh, not being able to pass emissions on from that model year. So you do run the risk of not being able to pass emissions, which maybe why a lot of people didn't do that so much. But it's interesting that a lot of these parts from or a lot of the engines made in the 1970s started their origins back in the late 50s and early 60s and throughout the 60s for many domestic manufacturing. So parts are easily swappable at the cost of getting your car renewed each year. So I guess um, there's pros and cons to everything. I think the reason why we look back at the, six, at, at the 70s and 80s as terrible years for wanting to own and drive a car is the lack of power, the lack of performance. And that's because Americans have now realized California has a haze of smoke so bad that in some days it partially obscures skyscrapers from view. That's how bad it got. And people are breathing it. And since in the north, in the uh, northern hemisphere, winds travel from, that would be west to east. So that Californian smog is going to flow across the whole country. And other, other states have their own cars and they're producing their own emissions, so it compounds that even more. There's a reason why, at least with California being the most populous state in the whole country, there's a reason why that their emissions got pretty stringent. More people, more cars. And because of that, the more smog, it does, just doesn't disappear over California, it flows across the whole country. They're thinking if they can limit the most out of California, it's not so bad across the whole country, and the rest of the country is producing its own smog at pre-California levels uh, through and through. Nowadays, all, all cars have uh, uh, 50 states emissions regulations that regardless of where your car was sold, you can still drive in California, regardless. There's no special Californian emissions equipment anymore. That's all standard across the board now. It's been that for the last 20 years. But you couldn't move from Wisconsin to California in your non-compliant Californian smog car. You wouldn't be able to own it. You'd have to sell it before you even enter the state. Or you can get into the state, but once you become a, a Californian resident, legally through mailing out uh, mailing address and driver's license you had to give up your car for a californian smog compliant car that's just how it is and they did that well into the 90s and in early 2000s you couldn't possibly well i don't know about today they're, they're probably still stringy about that anyway so lack of power Lack of acceleration. But you got good gas mileage. At least for smaller cars. But beyond that, mechanically, do cars of the six, uh, 60s, 60s are bulletproof, but same as the 70s and 80s, do they deserve the same rap? Uh, or do, do they deserve to be shit on by the general public that during this period, cars were built pretty shoddy. Well, yes and no. You will find shittily made cars. But you also find well-quality produced cars of the same assembly line. 
really depends on who did it. Someone who's not going to take care on what they do will certainly score up a cylinder wall, lightly bent a valve to where that doesn't move freely. Um, defective parts will find their way in cars. It just depends on who's assembling it and who catches it. It's really more of an assembly quality problem more than design. However, some designs just suck overall. Um, maybe there's a few blunders out there. Blunders, blunders. The Chevy Vega was supposed to have a Rankle engine. And it didn't. It's the same Rankle engine that would eventually be found in the AMC Pacer years later. Um, AMC was already developing the Pacer platform in the early 70s. They knew this was going to be the case. They were working with GM at the time. And when they told them, well, we're not developing a Wankel engine for a Vega anymore because we can't seem to figure out Apex seals and all other seals and really... Wankel engines, as, as cool as they really are, they need to really act like a two-stroke. And in the 1970s for uh, emissions, you really couldn't do that anymore. <laughs> for newer production cars, you could not do that. So the Vega was already a problem, because it was meant to have a Wankel engine. But it had a big enough engine bay to swallow practically anything small. Which I believe would give birth to the Iron Duke, or is the Iron Duke? I believe it could be the Iron Duke. Um, I don't know. Mechanically, nothing stands out. It's all conventional, it all ran fine, and when it did break down, it was still cheap to fix. You're still looking at an analog engine. Even in the 1980s when you had um, throttle body and early versions of electronic fuel injection, it was still relatively easy to fix just because their genes, the engines produced during this time, still had some genes from older engine designs of the 60s and 70s. So, not so bad. It's really until the next generation after the 70s and 80s for engines, transmissions, and axles did things get a bit more costly because newer technology means a lot more electronic components, which now you need to be a software engineer to fix your shit. Now, these days, you need more of an engineering electrical degree to fix a car now than you do need a mechanical engineering degree because it's all run by sensors. And the sensors do help, which why back in the day they called uh, warning lights idiot lights, because you had to figure it out yourself. Still, it's easier to figure out the problems of an older car than a newer one. That's funny. That's one thing I've noticed. I can pinpoint an issue on an older car, but yet on a newer one you have to use a scan tool, because you really don't know what it could be. It's amazing. You know exactly what it is, but you got to find out just by plugging it in. Mechanical analog car. You literally go through a short list of stuff that can go wrong, and a lot of it's pretty simple. And it doesn't take that much long either. So, mechanically, the 70s and 80s don't deserve the shit they have been shit on. In fact, there's a lot of good. There is a lot of good engines out there during this time period that were practically bulletproof and are still being. Uh, salvage to be used in other cars as well during this time for hobbyists collectors whatnot or just basic use they're good engines they're good transmissions or drive axles or uh, transaxles i can't see so much an issue with them there's they're not far removed from pre-computer chip days of you know, the late 70s, 
there's not much that can go wrong. It just really depends on how well they're made. Much like the next two subjects. But you're going to get into it in just a bit. So thanks for listening. And we'll talk about interiors on the next video.